Monday the 8th of September, 1980. Nine days into a 19-day crime spree, Mickey and Jimmy were on the run. Across four robberies, they'd stolen a total of £1,500, £8,200 today, only to squander it all on booze, birds and boogieing. As if these lame losers were criminal kingpins. Being cowardly half-wits, who were incapable of committing a single crime unless they were half-cut. With no plan, no preparation, no disguise, and being drunk. Two seemingly simple thefts had ended in a brutal double murder and an attempted murder, owing to Mickey being a sadistic psychopath. They were as lazy as they were stupid. As so far, Every crime they'd committed, and every victim they'd attacked, was a neighbour in the community they'd grown up in. Until the last victim, Sebi, the sub-postmaster, had made it clear that he knew Mickey's name. Leaving his fingerprints on a card, a bullet at the scene of the crime, and his name on the victim's tongue. Having survived, the police now had Mickey's details. Fearing his arrest, their pal John Hamilton had fled. Jimmy, as always, would minimise his involvement in either the murder or the attempted murder. And alongside Mickey, who wasn't the brightest, they didn't flee the country. In fact, they barely left the county, having sped seven and a half miles east to Romford in Essex. Split three ways, the £560 they'd swiped from Sibby's till was spent within four days. On Friday the 12th of September 1980, being typically cowardly, that evening, after a few pints, they burgled an unoccupied carpet shop on South Street, stealing just £29. With it barely being enough, For a night in a hotel, they also burgled the newsagents at 61 Longridge Road in Barking, just two and a half miles from home. With £329 in their pockets, even though their faces weren't in the papers, it was only a matter of time before they were caught. So unable to party it up at Snob's Disco, they headed to Clacton-on-Sea. As a place Mickey had spent many happy times with his family, as well as part of an ill-fated rehabilitation program with a detention centre, here they piddled away their ill-gotten gains on fairground rides, arcade machines, candy floss, and of course, getting trolleyed and chatting up girls. They didn't give an ounce of remorse, having brought misery and death to the East End, as all they cared about was fun. That Sunday, as the pounds became pennies, Mickey sent his mother Shirley a series of photographs taken in Clacton. The first showed Jimmy smiling, sat on a sun-drenched wall with a girl, arm in arm and looking happy and well. And the second was of Jimmy and Mickey standing side by side. Out of context, they looked like two lads enjoying a jolly at the seaside. Not a serial robber and a sadistic psychopath. Arriving a few days later, on the back, Mickey wrote, Sunday the 14th of September 1980. And although it would seem like a kindly gesture by a mummy's boy, the detectives presumed that this was part of his alibi. The next day, Monday the 15th of September, police raided every one of their known haunts. From Jimmy's mum's home in Hammersley Avenue, to Mickey's mum's house on Folkestone Road, to the bedsit of every friend and associate, and every pub and club they were known to frequent, including Snob's Disco. Police believed 
They could be hiding anywhere in East London. But having exhausted every possible hideout, and being reduced to sleeping in an unused room in St. Thomas's Hospital, they both headed west, 12 and a half miles west, to Shepherd's Bush. On the north of Shepherd's Bush Green, between the Wellington Pub, the Bookies and the Tube, stood the shoebox at 122 Oxbridge Road. As an old-fashioned cobbler's, where men could get leather shoes handmade by an experienced craftsman that had been part of the community for more than a decade. Set in a five-story Victorian terrace, it had a basement for storage, a showroom on the ground floor with a shoemaker's workshop out back, the owner's flat on the first floor, and the upper flats only accessible by a side door. Although quiet, it did well, but it rarely had more than two customers in at any time. The owner was 47-year-old Nathaniel Taylor, known as Nat, a white-haired, bespectacled Jewish gentleman who, although a widower, was always smiling and always polite. His former employee, Evel James, said of him, he was a helpful, peaceful man, very obliging, and if you ever wanted something and he hadn't got it, he would make a point of going to Northampton to get it for you. As a single man with a business which more than covered his overheads, Nat's only vice was gambling. Often popping a few doors down to the betting shop to place five pounds or ten pounds a time on a horse. This was his little piece of fun, of which he didn't accrue any debts. He only spent what he could afford. And although he had a reputation for being a regular winner, this wasn't the reason for his brutal murder. Across the 1970s, Shepherd's Bush had become a hotbed of petty crime. Errol said, We always had trouble with gangs of youths trying to steal shoes and money. Nat was robbed at knife point several times. And being wise enough, he knew never to fight back. He only kept a small amount of money in the till. And a local paper at the time even reported, Mr. Taylor blames it on the leniency of local magistrates. Wednesday the 17th of September 1980 was an ordinary day. Being term time, the warm pavements upon Shepherd's Bush Green were thick with shoppers as they shuttled between the market and the tube, sometimes stopping off at a cafe. As was his routine, at 3.30pm, Nat headed to the bookies and popped a note on the door saying, back in 10 minutes. As a local, he knew the bad lads who he had to be wary of. But having fled East London, owing to their faces being too well known. His next two assailants were a few doors down at the Wellington pub. Down to their last few pennies, Mickey and Jimmy sat supping the last of their pints of harp lager. Again they were drunk. Again they had no plan. Again they had no disguise. And again they had no compassion. They would claim, we picked it because it was close to the pub we were drinking in. And being armed with knives and a gun, at about 3.40 p.m., they both entered and pretended to be prospective customers. Good afternoon, Good afternoon gents. gents. What can I do for you? Nat would have said. Engaging in friendly banter, the boys would have looked harmless enough being baby-faced and fair-haired. Until from the jackets, both boys pulled six-inch blades and Mickey smacked Nat squarely in the face, flooring him. 
closing the door. As the Yale lock sealed the street from the looming violence within, and a large display of shoes shielded the large window. Mickey pulled Nat into the back room as Jimmy went hunting for the money. As an old-fashioned shop, he didn't see a cash till, so all he saw was an empty cash box. Mickey was fuming. Is that it? Where's the till? I don't have one. There must be. There isn't. As with the Herberts, Mickey had mistakenly believed that there had to be a fortune stashed away. But having been robbed several times before, the shoebox only ever carried the bare minimum. And no matter how hard Mickey beat this elderly gentleman about the face, he had no more money to give. At about 3.45pm, Leonard, Nat's nephew, arrived to help his Uncle Nat lock up. Finding the door locked and the lights off, but no sign suggesting that he was at the bookies, Leonard let himself in with his own key. Had these grunting buffoons bothered to do any research, they'd have known that Leonard visited the shop every day at the same time. Pulled inside and dragged upstairs, as Mickey drew the pistol on both men to keep them quiet. Always an arse coverer, Jimmy would later tell the court, I knew he'd got a gun, but he didn't plan to use it. And yet having described his pal as a nutter, just plain evil, he had already seen how Mickey acted when he didn't get what he wanted. And yet again, he'd gone along with it. As a cowardly alibi, Jimmy would claim, As I was searching for the till, I heard two shots. Unarmed and defenseless, Leonard and Nat were gunned down in cold blood. But because these single-brained bandits had shown their faces, left their fingerprints, and even said their own names, two good men were killed owing to two idiots' stupidity. Leonard and Nat were discovered within a few minutes. As a passing customer had been startled by the shots, heard a series of loud screams and groans, and having looked in the window, she was barged aside as Mickey and Jimmy, not wearing disguises, ran from the shop and fled in a taxi. Peeping inside, I saw a white-haired old man spread out over some fallen shoeboxes. And although an ambulance and the police were called swiftly, Nat was already dead. And en route to the hospital, Leonard died of his injuries. Described by Detective Chief Inspector Michael O'Leary as a cold-blooded killing, everything is nasty about it. The police were said to be baffled by such a motiveless crime as nothing had been taken and a hundred pounds was found in the cash drawer. But with both assailants seen by witnesses, their palm prints found in the shop and a bullet matching the shooting of the sub-postmaster on Catherine Street in East Ham, 23-year-old Michael Jameson and 25-year-old James Anderson were now wanted in East and West London. As fugitives, they were on the run. So where did they flee to? Scotland? France? Maybe to the Costa del Sol, dubbed the Costa del Crime, as that's where Britain's thickest criminals often run to? No. Being brainless buffoons, they headed back home to Plasto. with several streets still sealed off by police tape. 
Two days later, every newspaper was emblazoned with their names, details, and the latest photos that Mickey had sent to his mother, unwittingly giving the police the most accurate description of themselves. And although they would warn, publicize our names, and more innocent people will die, with four people already dead, these hoodlums had to be stopped. Speaking to their families, Jimmy's mum said, If he came back, I'd show him in, and then I'd go out and I'd call the police. Whereas Mickey's mum said, The newspapers report that Michael is a psychopath. It's complete rubbish. Only all the evidence would refute that. With the facts plastered across every paper, described as Britain's most wanted killers, people were warned that they were armed and extremely dangerous, as well as sick, deranged and insane. So it made no sense that these two fugitives would head back to where they were known. But they did. On the morning of Saturday the 20th of September 1980, having headed right into the heart of where they were being hunted, they knocked on the door of Jean McCarthy, an old school friend of Mickey's mum at 60 Cecil Road in Plaster. They picked a bad time to be outside as the streets were crammed full of police. But maybe that was the point. As with Jean's home, being just a short walk from Upton Park. As avid West Ham fans, it's likely they'd come back as their team were playing against Watford. Whether they wanted to watch the match on the telly or simply to soak up the roar of the crowd via the window, at 10am, having knocked on the door, Kim Kirby, the pregnant 20-year-old tenant of the ground floor flat, led them in. Kim would state, we all went up to Jean's flat. But having seen the pictures of this murderous twosome in the papers, Jean looked very scared. She went straight out and didn't return. That should have been the moment for Mickey and Jimmy to run. But they didn't. They had a cuppa. They popped on the telly. And in preparation for the match, they watched the news. Kim said, the TV news came on. And then on the screen were their pictures. I began to shake like a leaf. I hadn't recognized them until then. I said, is that you? They replied, It is. I was frightened. But with both men being very nervous and panicky, this scared me even more. But with Kim not wanting to be part of this, she left them alone in the first floor flat. That should have been the moment for Mickey and Jimmy to run. But they didn't. Having spent every penny of the £1,870 had stolen, roughly £10,000 today on fun and fillies, they were now stuck, as their closest friends had disowned them and their families refused to give them shelter. Even though again, Mickey's mum would state, I would stake my life that Michael had nothing to do with the killings. At 12.30 p.m., police received a tip-off about their location. It's uncertain why, but possibly having gone to the shops to get a few cans of beer to watch the match, Mickey had gone outside in the daylight. At 1 p.m., Kevin Byrne, a neighbor, was fixing his car. When I saw a man running along with a revolver, Four policemen soon arrived. They were all armed. So insistent were the police that these murderers had to be stopped. 
dead or alive. Though the street was blocked, police marksmen occupied homes on Cecil Road and Stopford Road with their guns trained on the flat, and a trained negotiator bellowed from a loud hailer. Mickey and Jimmy, you are surrounded. There is nowhere you can run. Throw out your weapons and come out with your hands up. Having barricaded themselves in, as a further six police marksmen crowded behind a wall, Detective Constable Cathro, the negotiator, ordered, Keep your hands on the wall or what fire? As one of the boys shouted back, The only way you'll get me out is in a box. Only the police weren't messing around. This wasn't playtime. So with several officers having smashed down the door with a sledgehammer, rushing in, a single shot rang out across the street. But this wasn't the boys fighting back, as having accidentally fired off a shot owing to nerves and inexperience. They quickly surrendered, tossed out the gun, and being bundled to the pavement, they were both arrested. After a two-hour armed siege, their 19-day crime spree had come to an end. Taken to East Ham and Plasto police stations, when questioned, Mickey refused to say a single word. Whereas Jimmy gave a detailed account of their crimes, during which he blamed the cruelty and their death on his former pal and limited his own involvement, which caused a massive rift between them. Two trials were held at the Old Bailey. The first was the murder of Joe and Kitty Herbert. As the recorder of both trials, Although concluded on the 14th of October 1980, Judge Miskin QC decreed that no details of the first trial should be published until the second trial, the murder of Nathaniel Taylor and his nephew Leonard Mintz, had resolved. On the 28th of November 1981, Jimmy arrived in court with severe razor slashes down his face, having been attacked supposedly by Mickey while on remand at Wandsworth Prison. Blaming each other for the crimes they'd both committed, Jimmy denied his involvement in either murders or attempted murder. And although Mickey tried to plea insanity, the prosecution said, there is a difference between badness and madness. This was just plain evil. It has nothing to do with diminished responsibility. At both trials, with neither showing any remorse for those they had killed, they laughed, whistled, shouted over witness statements, and were kept apart owing to their hatred of one another. On the 3rd of September 1981, after four hours of deliberation, a jury of seven men and five women returned with a unanimous verdict. Of the attempted murder of Sebi the sub postmaster, Mickey was found guilty of murder as only he was holding the gun. Of the murder of the Herberts, Mickey was found guilty of murder, but Jimmy could only be convicted of conspiracy to rob. But of the killing of Leonard Minutes and Nathaniel Taylor with the shoebox, both were found guilty of armed robbery and willful murder. Sentenced that day, James Anderson bowed his head and showed no signs of emotion as he received two life sentences, of which he would serve at least 20 years in prison, plus 16 years for robbery and theft. Michael Jameson, who was described in court as a born psychopath, yawned noisily and spat a sweet into the well of the court as his sentence was pronounced. Found guilty of all charges, 
he received five life sentences, plus 19 years for robbery, of which he would have to serve a minimum of 30 years. But their behavior was no better in prison than out. In June 1983, Jimmy participated in a riot at Wormwood Scrubs Prison as one of six hostage situations that year. Prisoners armed with dustbins and bed legs injured 25 warders as they overran D-Wing. It was said by the governor to have been premeditated by a hardcore of young and violent men. A month early, Mickey was one of several convicts moved to another prison, having been instrumental in a three-hour riot at Albany Prison on the Isle of Wight during which, using wooden staves, metal bars, and broken glass, they went on a rampage in D-Block, causing a million pounds worth of damage. Neither of them would settle into the prison life that they'd earned. And although they had both done the crimes, it was Mickey who couldn't serve the time. In June 1990, Mickey was transferred to HMP Fall Sutton, a Category A high-security prison in York. By October, he'd requested to be moved back to Wormwood Scrubs to be near his family, due to his mental deterioration. But this was denied, as he was considered a bad prisoner. On the 25th of November 1990, he wrote a letter to his mother stating, I don't want to go on living, and that he thought of starving himself to death. On the boxing day, he'd sliced up his left arm, but with the wound only requiring 18 stitches, it wasn't deemed too serious, as he'd exclaimed to the doctor, I feel better. Overseen in the prison's hospital wing, he was returned to a single cell on the 23rd of January, 1991. At 8.10am the next morning, John Weldrick, an orderly, opened the hatch to see what he wanted for breakfast. He'd state, I spoke to him several times, but he didn't answer. He appeared to be looking out of the window from behind the curtains which were drawn. The cell was in darkness and having called for another orderly to help him. As they pulled back the curtains, they found Mickey kneeling, a ligature around his neck, held in place by the bars of the window. He'd been dead for several hours. 43-year-old Michael Jameson, also known as Mickey, had spent more than half of his life in prison, ball stalls and detention centres. Whether he would have ever been released owing to his bad behaviour is uncertain. But with his father having been locked up in Broadmoor Psychiatric Hospital when Mickey was growing up, one question remains. Was Mickey just cruel? Or as the court had decreed, was the shoebox killer a born psychopath? we go <coughs> hat off for you guys there we go hat off oh I, I think i forgot to say it on the last one welcome to extra mile unscripted unedited bit uh leaving your little hat there oh i'm just gonna open up some uh, some windows a little bit it's not it's not a warm day but it's one of those days where it's it's been a bit uh it's, it's about to piss down and I had to close all the windows and shut everything over because the Tweety birds are out going, Oh, tweet, tweet, tweet. Oh, look, it's uh, it's going to rain in a bit. Oh, tweet, tweet, tweet. Uh, as always, so uh, let me just let me just do that. 
I'm not, I might just put a little bit of hot water in my tea. I still got a tea on the go. Is this any good? I've got half a cup of tea. I don't think I'll make a cup of tea. It just seems a waste of gas and, and uh, stuff. So I'll just, I'll just sit back. I'll just come back. I'll finish my, my, um, my Tetley tea with oat milk. I've tried to move on to oat milk now. Only because they say that soy milk isn't good for your liver. And I'm trying to avoid cow tip milk at the moment. Uh, it makes me it makes me very windy. Very windy. Uh, so I'm on the oat, mi oat milk at the moment. So there we go. Oh, Michael, your life is so exciting, isn't it? Wow. Um, still on my diet. I'm back on my diet. Only because I think it's because my, my back started to go out in November. Um, and uh, my big toe was playing up. So I slowed down my walking and then I thought, oh, it's December, oh, I'll have some fun. I'll go off my diet and have some fun. And basically, because of bronchitis as well, three weeks ago, bronchitis, two weeks of strep, another three weeks where my back went out as well. Um, I think I've had, I've had like five months of just pigging out now. So yeah, I've packed on the old, the old blubbage. Uh, which Eva loves. She she likes poking me. Like like the Pillsbury Doughboy, she just pokes me in the stomach all day and then she giggles. And it keeps her very happy. But uh, now, because it's summertime, and we've got a beach, beach holiday coming up soon, uh, she needs me to slim down a bit. Uh, she doesn't want me blocking the sun. That's the problem. It's like when I when I bend out, put her, her drink down, she doesn't want my gigantic arse blocking the sun. So she wants me more svelte. <sighs> Got to do what Madam wants. Uh, what else is going on? Uh, it's it's almost the bank holiday weekend. I think we're building up for that. What date is it today? It's the second of May for me today. Recording this, so um, it's on uh, in Little Venice. By the time you you get this, it'll have passed. But in Little Venice, they, I think they I think it's Canavalcade as they call it. So they have all the all the shiny boats turn up, and it's. It's nice people turn up there and they go, oh, look at these boats. Oh, aren't they lovely? Oh, lovely. Oh, it must be lovely living. And they speak to the people there and they go, oh, it must be li lovely living on the canal. But what they don't realise is the people with the shiny boats don't actually live on the canal. They have houses near the canal or their boat is in a marina, but they're never on it. These are just the, the guys who spend all their time tinkering with their boat. And, shi and we call them the shinies because like all the brass on them is really shiny. And uh, some of them are parked up just around the corner from me. And I've seen them there today. It's like it's like they moored up their boat. And because their boat went within half an inch of a gnat, a gnat's fart, they were like, oh, got to get the paint out. Oh, got to clean it. Oh, like that. So you see all these boats and they what they, they have all their badges about all oh, the places they've traveled to. But that was like ages ago. They, they don't do that anymore. So all these boats are coming past now. And because these guys have... Um, because they don't they don't really go anywhere in their boats they do little holidays every so often they go oh i'm gonna do the do the uh the langolan stretch so i can get my badge for it um but they don't really know how to drive because they're not like the rest of us they're not always on the boat so uh they they come charging past you not realizing that when you go past another boat you've got to be on tick over which is the slowest speed that your boat can do it's it's slower than walking speed but they don't they're, they're like no i need to get to canaveral k to get my prime position so i can show off my boat that i don't really go anywhere in except to except to places like this so people can look at my boat and go oh look at your boat it's shiny so that's going on this weekend uh what else is going on oh it seems to be uh, baby coot season so i saw a couple yesterday they're very fu they're very funny they're, they're little baby coots they're like um they're like me they're like short fat round punk rockers they're like round and spiky with a little red bit on top they're really funny so uh yeah if you if you get a chance if you're near any any stretch of water go and go and have a look at the baby coots they're very funny um what else is going on not really a lot not really a lot try to get back to exercise again uh, now i'm almost back to health i think let's hope i don't get sick again um let's do some quiz questions 10 quiz questions and then we'll do some extra stuff about the episode then we'll answer the questions in a bit and then i will sit here by myself editing the episode for the rest of today and then the rest of tomorrow by myself uh and then i'll go for a walk oh it's exciting this is the weird bit. It's like I'm talking to you. You can't talk back to me. It's like I've just done an hour of talking to get the, the narration for this done. And then I'm doing this bit talking to you. So that's another half an hour. And then suddenly when it stops, 
everything is silent for me. There's like a really weird silence where there's nothing happening. And I just go, oh, make a cup of tea and then start editing. There we go. What an exciting life I lead. Well, that, that's it, isn't it? Um, let's do a quiz question. OK, question number one. How much money had they stolen in total? I've done it in old money and new money. So you, you can have either. We can do both if you like. Uh, question number two. What was the name of Mickey's mother? Question number three. On the run in East London, where were they reduced to sleeping in an old... Dis <sighs> That's not even a good question. <coughs> when they were on the run in East London, they were reduced to sleeping in, a, in an unused room in which hospital? There you go. That's the question. Question number four. What was the name of the pub they were in before the shoebox killing? Question number five. What was the name of Nathaniel Taylor's former employee? Question number six: Where would where did his inform? Where did his? I'm trying to change the question. I'm trying to add to the question while while I'm saying it. I'll just bollocks to it. Where would Nathaniel go if you wanted something shoe based, but he didn't have it? So that was something that his former employee said. So where would Nathaniel go if you wanted something shoe based, i.e., something for a shoe, and he didn't have it in stock? Question number seven, what was the name of the cab driver who dropped them off at the station? Question number eight, what was the name of that station? Question number nine, how much money was stolen from the shoebox? And question number ten, who were West Ham playing that day? Wah, football, wah, wah. ball, ball, kicky ball, kick it in the net. Yeah. So who were West Ham playing that day? There we go. Uh, let's dive into some extra stuff on this uh, stuff that may not have made it into the episode um as i've already mentioned there'd already been quite a few robberies of um the shoebox in advance oh don't forget some of those quiz questions i might balls up because i haven't edited the episode yet and this is the unedited bit so if i balls them up that's fine you get a free point don't worry about it um they've been robbed several times before so because we, with this case we haven't, we haven't got the police files because they're not available till 2081 i think it is uh i haven't got the court records so i had to <coughs> use every other source that i knew so therefore there's something so i had to do a lot of back histories on this and going through the press i was like oh wow there's loads of robberies in there and because jimmy and mickey had done quite a few robberies um on the same places so with the herberts they had robbed the herberts before that's how they knew to get in robbers are very lazy they don't like to do research they don't like to get off the fat asses. as you can see in this case they they mostly rob in the in and around their neighborhood because they're really fucking useless um but robbers if they've burgled the place once they'll go back to the same place why because they know that uh, people would have had they They'll rob a place and then they'll go back a short while later because they'll know that the person would have replaced the items that they've already nicked. It's um, it's what they do. So it was it was kind of assumed that Mickey and Jimmy had actually robbed the shoebox prior, but it looks like they haven't. There's loads of robberies, but it seems that there was a bit of a an influx of gangs of youths coming in uh, from Shepherd's Bush or coming into Shepherd's bush and rob in the area because it's like there's loads of shops and it's near the tube and you can escape really easily and you know that that's what that's what people who don't have brain cells and uh like to become criminals that's what they do they go for easy targets don't they um so it looked like they may have been pre-planning on this but it seems it's it really does seem like there was no pre-planning it looks like they just from from east ham and plasto you can kind of go you can you can kind of go central line ish you can hop on a jump bus get on the central line um and then you can go straight to shepherd's bush so it really gets you through the city and then out to the west end so it looks like they may have just chosen it at random we don't know whether they were at one of their remand centers or something like that maybe they knew shepherd's bush because of that we don't have their criminal histories which is a real pain in the ass i did go looking for it couldn't find it so uh, we don't know why they chose shepherd's bush it could have been random they could have been going to see some friends they could um because west qpr are based there oh check me in my football knowledge so um yeah they, they they could have been there going to going to watch 
a, a football match. Hey, football, hey. Put the round thing in the goal. Brilliant. Hey. So I was on the tube the other day with... Um, there was some kind of football match. I don't really know or care what it was. And uh, about 100 knuckle-scraping morons got on. And I say knuckle-scraping morons, not to be derogatory The people like football. I have no problem if you like football. It was just, you know, I have no problem with people when you're in your football ground... Do what you want, that's fine. Or if you're in a pub that's dedicated to football, do what you want. But this was, it was a nice tube. Everyone was going out on a Saturday night. There was families there. There was elderly people. And all these yobs got on. And they were shouting at each other because one team liked one thing and the other team liked something different. And doing all shit. And they didn't give a shit about anyone else. They didn't give a shit. Next to me was a lady who was breastfeeding and next to her was a two-year-old. And they were there going, oh, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, shouting, and the kid looked scared, and it was just like, you, and, and it's not like they were young lads, these were middle-aged men who should have known better, and I mentioned it to my friend the other day, who, who loves football, and he, there was a look on his face like, like, oh, I don't understand why you're, why you're having to go at them about that, it's like, oh, you know, they're just supporting the team, it's like, no, it's just like, respect for other people, when you're out in the community, you don't need to walk along the street like a gang going, ay, 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 like that being utter tits, if you're in your, in your area, in your stadium, fine, do it there, in a pub, do it there, but when you're out on the street, act like a civilised human being, you don't need to act like a yob, I just, I just, oh, this, that's what really, I really find obnoxious about football, is that in no other sport do you have that kind of normal, decent people turning into yobs for no reason, just re that really annoyed, especially just the, just the way sh they were actively shouting within maybe a meter of a lady who was breastfeeding a child with a two-year-old who looked looked quite perturbed about it i just thought you've just got no compassion for other people just because of your shitty little sport there we go rant over you don't get that with other sports do you though you don't get that with taylor swift fans you don't get that with anything else but suddenly people with football they feel the need that you've got to act like a fucking moron that really pisses me off that really really annoy that anyway I did, I, why did I go on that rant? I, I think it was just in my head. Just read really, oh, some things, as you know, some things really piss me off, and that really pissed me off. Just a lack of compassion for other people really is. Uh, not to say that all football fans do that. They, you know, many of them, many of them can be very good, decent. There was some, there was some on there who looked ashamed, and rightfully ashamed as well. But there we go. There we go. Anyway, anyway, the 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 tube went past Wembley. They all got off at Wembley, and I was like, good riddance uh what else is that so i can't remember where we got to on this the robbery yeah no ah so they the, they were drinking in a pub nearby we're not going to say the name of the pub because obviously that's one of the quiz questions so it it really does look like they they randomly chose that area they went there they they got they did as they always did they got trolled they had no plan they hadn't got disguised mickey was carrying a gun they got a knife on them they just randomly picked randomly picked a place they walked past several places and they thought well there's an old guy by himself we'll rob there not really thinking about the fact that he's been robbed multiple times before had they done the research they would have known that it was in the newspapers um or even it's a shoe shop for god's sake it's not like he has multiple customers and, he, and he's going to be rammed he's not really going to have the he's not really going to have a cash till that's bursting if it's a news agency, yeah, that that would have a, a high turn. Like, I used to work in a 24-hour garage at, at university. And um, that wasn't university. That was at university. That's how I was able to fund it. Um, the University of 24-Hour Garage. And um, because we were churning over so much money so long and the till had kind of a limit of, like, 300 quid... I think it was like like every hour or every hour and a half we'd have to we'd have to take out all the notes and put them in the special cash box and it wouldn't let us do any more work get any more money in until we got rid of that so a news agent is a great i'm not saying that people should rob a news agent but it's a high turnover but it's also high traffic whereas these guys had picked low traffic place when was the last time any of us went into a cobbler's shop what utter utter idiots utter idiots anyway there we go 
that's i think that's the epitome of this story is the fact that these guys really have no idea what they're doing they really want to be gangsters they want to be criminals they want to be all exciting but they just haven't got anything in their heads that's that's worthwhile um what is the um I think that's it. I've, I've kind of pretty much given you everything about that individual shooting itself. It's it's an odd street to pick because it's a very busy street. It's it's on a thoroughfare. Even if you go there today, it's on a thoroughfare with loads of shops. It's on a green, so you can kind of be seen from all sides of this area. Um, there's a big window. Whether they chose it because there was a big display, it's kind of two big windows on the side and then in the centre is kind of a little door and you go through the little door and maybe they chose it because of the uh, the big window displays. The, the kind of cover a th- two maybe two thirds of the height of it, so maybe that's why they chose it. But also it's a shoe shop. You, it's, it's funny that, it's not really funny, but it's kind of ironic that with the previous robbers who'd robbed the shop, there'd been a few of them, all of them had tried to steal an amount of money. There was almost no money in the shop. And therefore they, they stole shoes. And you just go, why would you steal shoes? It's like, it's so specific. It's like you steal a pair of shoes, but then you're like, okay, I need to find someone who's willing to buy a pair of size 10 brogues in brown. And you just go, well, well, good luck to you. Because someone's going to go, do you have them in a 9 or an 11? Or do you have them in black? No, of course you don't. But then again, criminals are always thick as shit. Absolute thick as shit. I love all these programs on the telly where they... There was one program, it was a ser- it was an American series. And oh, I can't remember what it's called. They, they show them on Channel 4 at the moment. And I, st- I had to stop watching it and I messaged them about it. Because... They were trying to big up the criminals all the time about how clever they were and how smart they were. And most of the time they're not. It's just if they get away with it, most of its time it's luck. Most of the time, let's be honest, it's down to the fact we don't have enough police officers. Like how how many police stations have been shut down now? How many less police officers do we have? Do you know, when you call the police now, do you know what what is the response time, especially in certain areas of town? You're going to be slightly screwed. So, you know, if you are going to commit a robbery... You could say, oh, I did all my great planning. But really, let's be honest, whether you get caught or not is really going to be based around whether there's going to be police officers in and around the area or not. I always thought, I thought about this ages ago, that if I was going to do a bank robbery, and I don't plan to do a bank robbery, but if I was going to do a bank robbery, what I would ensure is I would leave bags with kind of fake bombs in them dotted around near parts of the city so like three four miles away from me really draw attention because I, th- I think we had the, the Hainault attack the other day I saw that on the news and uh there was a guy with a uh, a sword and he attacked a young boy I think it was a 14 year old boy who died in Hainault which is rare for us we don't really have a lot of crime like that but in order to contain that kind of scene there was at least at least 10 officers there and you may think that we have hundreds or thousands in there. You really don't. We really don't have a lot of police anymore, which is why the response times aren't that good. Because you know, unfortunately, police have to deal with mostly mental health issues. Quite often, deal with drunks. And you know, if you if you're being if you're being burgled, good luck. You're gonna have to wait. It's um, we don't have enough officers, and they're having to deal with too many crimes at the same time. So uh, yeah. So that would be my plan. The little, the little bags of bombs everywhere, fake bombs everywhere. So if you're going to do a, a bank robbery, um, all the police will be there, won't they? They'll all be focused elsewhere. Or you, 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 you set off at like a a very loud explosion somewhere that, somewhere that sets off loads of alarms. Does it? Can, it could be fireworks. It'd be nice and simple. That would keep the police distracted for an hour in different areas. There you go. They have to call in people to go. Oh, is it a bomb? You go. No, it's just some some idiot with uh, some fireworks solved you can do the bank robbery because the police response time will be three minutes it'll be 10 minutes 15 minutes that's not that's not helpful advice for people who want to do bank robberies that's just me having a uh, a brain fart there we go um um the photos uh he sent to his mother um 
kind of odd really are odd we so michael sent a series of photos to his mother uh, i didn't mention this in the episode because it throws it off but including in inverted commas an attractive brunette and on the reverse he'd written the name jeanette jeanette seems to be um michael's girlfriend about that time although it could also be jamie uh jimmy's we're not too sure um obviously on the back he'd written the date sunday the 14th of september 1980 which is when they were in clacton and the police did kind of believe that this was the the start of an alibi obviously by this point they'd already killed the herberts they would also go on to um commit the uh, uh the, the other ro- um the the shoebox and these photos arrived so the shoebox was on the wednesday the 17th and the photos um arrived at his mother's on the 18th and were in the papers the next day so clearly they took taking the photos clearly this was like oh shit we've committed a murder it doesn't say where the postmark on the letter came from do you know what i if we had the police files we would have all these details but we don't and we won't have the files for a long time so uh we're just gonna have to take educated guesses on this uh the tip off of how where they were we don't know where that came to um it came via an anonymous phone call at Plasto Police Station. Uh, the unidentified caller gave the name of one of the men now being sought and warned the uh, who had warned the police in advance uh, that if they publicised their names, more innocent people would be shot. Either Mike, either Mickey or Jimmy, or it could have been John Hamilton had called the police, and they were the ones who said, "If you announce our names, we're gonna we're gonna kill more people." But obviously, rightfully by that point, four people were already dead. Police were not willing to take um not willing to hold back on this they were like fuck them we, we, we're gonna track them down we're gonna get them so we don't know who gave the tip off of where they were it could have been gene who was was it mickey's old school friends uh, old school friend because she had left the house she, she apparently she didn't come back until the next day after the siege was over so it could have been her it could have been k uh on the ground floor it could have been k's brother because he was there as well it could have been one of the neighbours. It could have been the guy outside. It could have been anyone at the shops when Mickey went out to get some beers. Because even though he's on the run and even though he's a wanted man, he decided he needed some beers to go and watch the match. Utter tit. Utter, utter tit. Everything about this case is just incompetent, absolute idiots. But there we go. There we go. That's why they got caught. Um... And the sadness of all these people being being hurt and murdered because of these greedy little bastards, utter greedy little bastards. This is another one of those one of those cases where I felt it's too often with with true crime and especially criminal gangster kind of things, people feel they want to big up the gangsters and make them out to be oh, aren't they clever? Aren't, like with the Cray twins, aren't they clever? Aren't they smart? Oh look how amazing! Oh look, they give some money to some homeless people. Oh oh oh, we have to worship them but too often criminals just do it because they're because they're greedy because they're selfish because they're thick and let's just be honest about it let's just let's just call it like it is sometimes these people just need you just need to say they're thick as shit they're useless they what is the point to them they could have got he could have both these boys could have gone off got decent jobs just regular jobs earning a decent living provided for their children because let's not forget that um, jimmy had two children and mickey had one child as well they could have done the decent thing but they didn't why it's not about money it's about it's about oh i want to be a gangster i want to be a gangster yeah i like the criminal life fuck off you tit oh gangsters really piss me off just the 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 falseness of it like the amount of times that they'll claim responsibility for something but but they go oh no it's up to the police to find the evidence it's no no you didn't commit any of these crimes at all it's just you're happy to accept it because it builds up your reputation because you don't want people to know that really deep down you're just a waste of space but there we go um i kind of put in i've put in everything that i can about the um the um the siege Streets were blocked off, um, blocked off on uh, Cecil Street. It took me ages to find the exact address of, of uh, where it was on Cecil Street. The building is still there today. Um, street was blocked off. Uh, police took over two homes on Stopford Street, which is at the back, and then two homes on Cecil Street immediately opposite. Uh, Ada Guyler, 58, had four police marksmen in their flat, and they took over the upstairs and the downstairs kitchens. Uh, she said they had trained... 
They had guns trained on the house. I stayed in the front. The police would not allow me into the kitchen. I mean, she couldn't have a cup of tea. Jesus. And her sister lived in the ground floor flat. And she also had two armed officers with revolvers. Uh, and Charlie Mills, who was a neighbour, had three armed officers in his house. <coughs> Let's not forget that there's six armed officers against the garden wall as well. So these guys were surrounded. There's one door into the flat and that's it. It's not like that. It's not like it was a big block of flats. It was a house converted into flats. You had one door in, and that was it. Or you jump out the window and possibly risk breaking your legs. Um, I think that was it. Yeah. Oh, oh, I had one more thing. Oh, yeah, very, very briefly. Um, hang on, let me just get through this. Uh, w when they were committed, so the committal at. Uh, uh, East Newham Magistrates Court in East London on the 9th of October 1980. Uh, again, they both giggled in the dock and sniggered as the magistrate rep um, remanded them in custody for a week on four murder charges. So that's both of them acting like this. Um, the detective who handcuffed him uh, told both boys to cut it out and uh, Mickey whistled as he was led out of the court and laughed during the three minute hearing. There you go, that's for what you want. Um, during the trial, uh, Jeffrey Rich, who was um, James Anderson's lawyer, asked for the video material by the BBC uh, to be sent forward. So there'd been a lot of press coverage about this case, and he said, such press coverage uh, has not, to my knowledge, occurred before in a situation where two men have not been charged. They were described in press reports as the most dangerous men in England. The prejudice for the trial is going to be enormous. Uh, so therefore he asked for all of the uh, press reporting by the BBC, ITN and the independent ra radio network so he could look at them and go, oh, I think this is unfair. Unfortunately, you know, when you have lawyers, they um, they can do that. Uh, uh, 30th of October 1980, uh, solicitors representing the two men complained about the conditions they were being kept in. Uh, having been held at Romford Police Station owing to a police officer's dispute. Geoffrey Rich said, My client has been without a mattress and bedding for five days, as well as reading material, and his psychological condition has been very bad indeed when I saw him. Sean Murphy, for uh, Jameson, said, My client wants to make it known that he has not, uh, that he has not been allowed visitors for four days. He does not have a change of clothes or a toothbrush. Well, boo, fucking who? Tell that, tell that to the people whose uh, uh, lives you've ruined and whose uh, family members you've murdered. You twat! There we go. Uh, let's do the quiz questions. Question number one: How much had they stolen in total? It was one thousand eight hundred and seventy pounds, which is roughly ten thousand pounds today. Uh, question number two: Don't forget, this is. Um, that amount is split in some cases between two of them some cases split with john hamilton as well and some cases as um uh jimmy would say that uh, with the herbert's murder he, his his statement is very confused he uh, some cases he said he the john hamilton was there sometimes he said i left i left uh their house and left the two two of them there with mickey so that implies there were four people in total. So we don't know. So if it is a total of £10,000, if it's split between two, that's five. If it's split between four or even unevenly, that takes it down to two and a half, three thousand each. So it's not, not really a massive amount of, amount of money. I mean, they really are shit criminals. I mean, they're shit murderers and psychopaths. I think both of them are. Uh, question number two, what is the name of Mickey's mother? It was Shirley... When on the run in East London, they were reduced to sleeping in an unused room of which hospital? It's St. Thomas's Hospital. Question number four. What pub were they in before the shoebox killings? <coughs> it's called the Wellington Pub. Not there anymore. I, I, think, I think that is now where the McDonald's is. McDonald's. Uh, question number five. What is the name of Nathaniel Taylor's former employee? It was Errol James. Question number six. Where would Nathaniel... Oh, come on, Michael. Question number six. Where would Nathaniel go to if you wanted something shoe-based and he didn't have it? 
uh, he would go to Northampton, which uh, people in Northampton will know is kind of, uh, well, was the kind of the home of shoemaking and leather work and stuff like that. Uh, question number seven, what was the name of the cab driver who dropped them off at the station? Uh, Martin Fleischner. Question number eight, what station did they go to? Marleybone, which is kind of a weird one because they're, they're East London based and yet they've gone to Marleybone, which would take them kind of northwestish, west and northwestish, uh, and Midlands y. Kind of doesn't make any sense at all. Um, mm, yeah, kind of bit bit North London, Kent, not Kent, it wouldn't take them to Kent. Oh, who cares? Uh, question number nine How much money was stolen from the shoebox? It's a trick question. Uh, nothing was. Uh, it's weird. Some reports say forty pounds was taken, but when you look at look at the details in court, they said that nothing was taken. Although a hundred pounds was found in a cash box. Uh, and question number ten: Who were West Ham playing that day? It was Watford. So there you go, folks. I think I was a slightly longer. Uh, extra mile so sorry about that anyway i think that's me done uh, now time for utter silence so i'm going to sit here quietly and over the next two days edit this episode uh, in silence by myself so uh, thank you for supporting the show it's very much appreciated i hope you're having a good time and uh, stay well be good lots of love everyone bye